to Julian. I am so glad that you are here. If you're joining me on Instagram or YouTube, hello, welcome to our learning community. Let me introduce Instagram to YouTube real quick. Hello, hello, hello. This is a weekly introduction to so-called continental theory and psychoanalysis in which I try to explain and engage with the works of Slavoj Žižek, Hegel, Kant, Lacan, Freud, Marx, from a variety of different perspectives in a way that is hopefully enriching to both beginners and experts alike. If you're joining me from somewhere around the world, I'd love it if you dropped a comment letting me know where you're joining me from. Always brings me a lot of pleasure. I see someone from Chile. Hello, greetings. Turkey, good morning. Kosovo. Hello, that's wonderful. Thank you guys so much. I truly appreciate you. Um, if you're new to this channel, essentially two years ago, I was working as an educator at the University of Oxford Brooks when the pandemic forced us to shut down. I began live streaming my lectures for free on the internet and I've never looked back. This has been an ongoing lecture series for the past two and a half years. And you can drop in on any lecture, you can enjoy them standalone. However, they also form part of a longer three month series. In fact, right now, today, we are in week two of a new series engaging with Zizek's interpretation and analysis of Christianity and theology, of course, from a Hegelian perspective. Last week, we had the opening lecture called The Divine Madness, and today we're going to be continuing with another one of Zizek's interpretations, namely The Monstrosity of Christ, which is based on his book, The Monstrosity of Christ, and I'm going to try to engage with that idea here in a way that is hopefully instructive to you in your own studies and learning. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say a huge thank you to the uh, patrons who support this project, who allow me to keep doing this. If you become a patron, you are helping me keep these classes open access available for anyone to watch anywhere in the world, anytime. I'm a huge believer in the idea that education should be free that anyone should be able to study philosophy if they so wish. And by becoming a patron, you are enabling me to do so. So a huge thank you to our patrons. And as of today, also a huge thank you to everyone who has made a $1 donation on Instagram. Uh, if you are on Instagram watching this right now, there is a button on my profile page where you can become a subscribing member for $1 that gets you access to an exclusive chat that I host as well as videos that I make only for members to see. Uh, if you like these lectures, they're entirely free. You can enjoy them anytime you want. There's tons of them. There's more than 100 by now. But if you'd like to, and if you are able to, I would really appreciate a small donation in the form of either an Instagram membership, that's $1, or a Patreon membership, which starts at $5. Those of you who are in the higher tier on Patreon can also download my latest ebook, which is titled, And Yet It Moves, Five Lessons on Zizek. So if you're looking for a short introduction to the works of Slavoj Zizek, you can find that on my Patreon. The link is www.patreon.com forward slash Jenaline and Julian. I'll put the link in bio later. Thank you to everybody who joined me on Instagram this week, past weekend uh, in the live chat. It was highly entertaining for me and hopefully instructive to you. It's wonderful being able to use these new tools to engage with you in a manner that feels true to the spirit of what this project is. <clears throat> okay, on that note, let us begin, because there's a lot that I want to cover here. So the title of this lecture is The Monstrosity of Christ. I just got a message from someone saying that the audio is not working. I hope that is not true for everyone. The Monstrosity of Christ, which is also the title of Zizek's book on the very same subject. And what we're going to try to do in this lecture is I'm going to try to explain to you what exactly Zizek means by this highly provocative image of Christ as a monstrous figure. Now, to begin with, to cut straight to the chase, Zizek is here referencing the German idealist philosopher Hegel, who referred to Christ as das Ungeheure. And in German, an Ungeheure is something like a monster, something uh, like, for example, like if you refer to something as a monster from the sea or something like this, like a sea monster, that would be an ungeheuer, something uh, that exists 
as a kind of abomination, as it were. Now, when you hear this, the idea of Christ as an abomination, the idea of Christ as a monstrous figure, that might strike you as a form of blasphemy, as a form of speaking about Christ that appears to be distinctly unchristian. And yet, Hegel makes the argument that Christ is a monstrous figure precisely from the perspective of a Christian thinker. Now, how that works and how Hegel gets to that point is what we're going to be trying to explain in the following lecture. You do not have to be a Christian. You do not have to be an atheist. You do not have to subscribe to any one faith. This is meant to be a philosophical engagement with these ideas. Fret not. Now, I want to start somewhere completely different. Um, I want to start with the coronation, the coronation that just took place in the United Kingdom. Um, there's many things to say about it. Uh, it was a very interesting event. Uh, but perhaps the most telling moment was the minor kerfuffle, the public outrage, that occurred surrounding Archbishop Justin Welby's remarks, or the, the text which he spoke at the coronation. Now, originally, Justin Welby had indicated that he wanted to follow the monarch in diversifying this new monarchy, that the king would be open to more diversification. Of course, we saw multiple politically correct examples of this on display during the coronation as such. Some of them more moving, for example, Sir Bern Terfel, who uh, uh, sang the Kyrie in Welsh, which to my mind is an inclusive gesture that was very moving, but also somewhat perhaps more performative, photographically staged ones of putting people of color and women on the front row of the military parade, etc. All of which, of course, is part of the delicate balancing act that the crown has to perform to appear both relevant and yet distinctly necessarily antiquated. Not unlike the performative dimension, the balancing act that the church has to perform. In this sense, it is also key to point out, of course, that the monarch in the UK, the king, is also the direct representative of the Church of England, the highest representative thereof. In fact, in a more mystical sense, supposedly also the direct uh, represent, representation of God himself, hence the key mystical moment going back to, I don't know, the 12th century or something in which behind a screen the king has to be anointed in holy oil, etc. Now, aside from all this ceremonious pomp, Justin Welby's, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest uh, 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 religious figure in the country, suggested that the way in which one might diversify the monarchy was to take an antiquated aristocratic necessity, namely the necessity of the aristocracy to, sorry, there's something coming from the other room, to show fealty to the king. In other words, aristocrats essentially had to make themselves loyal to the king. They had to show that they were subjects that were, that were going to follow the king. And the archbishop suggested that paying homage, which is the official term for this practice, that paying homage, which used to be the select privilege of aristocrats, could in fact be di diversified. That now everyone could pay homage to the king. Of course, this was met with public outcry because the point of diversification isn't to make everybody a little bit more like the aristocracy, but precisely to make the aristocracy <laughs> like defunct, no longer existent. In other words, instead of giving everyone the privileges of the aristocracy, he was suggesting that everyone might have the obligations of the aristocracy to have to pay homage to the king. And in a perfectly politically correct gesture, the text was largely maintained in the coronation, except paying homage was changed to showing support for the king. And of course, that is the contemporary secular 
modern way of engaging with the monarchy is not to be the loyal submissive subject to the king, which has a distinctly antiquated taste to it, but instead to take a moment to appreciate the historos historicity of the event. And this is the beautiful paradox of the entire coronation is that most people who attended, whether on the street or in person or watching on TV, all of them said, I don't really believe in the idea of the monarchy. And yet, I believe like what is happening here is a key part of history. That here an historic event is taking place, and even though I don't believe in it, I feel like I ought to be here. I should be here. Now, before we lambast this and mock this as the sort of height of irrationality, in a sense, this is how all symbolic functions work. That one doesn't fully identify with them, one doesn't fully believe in them, one is there almost on behalf of everybody else's belief. This is the performative dimension of all symbolic power, that it's not about the direct belief or attribution of something to having inherent power, that the man who wears the crown is invariably the king. Instead, one is there as if on behalf of everybody, other, everybody else, if one shows up, it thereby becomes retroactively a historical event. In this sense, one could also look towards the protesters and make what to my mind seems the obvious and fair criticism. The picture of protesters with the slogan, not my king, therefore misrepresent the situation. The properly anti-monarchical anti position shouldn't be not my king, it should be I do not wish to be his subject. The problem after all is not the problem of king, the problem is the idea that a king necessitates one being subject to the king. In a sense, one could even take like an even older approach to this problem. Recall the famous passage from Saint-Just, where he said that the reason, the problem of the king, this is during the French Revolution, the reason the king has to be put on trial is not to determine whether or not he was a good king, but precisely to put him on trial because he is king. In other words, what ought to be put on trial is not whether he is your king or he is not your king, whether you might have preferred another king. What has to be put on trial is the very idea and the identity of kingness as such. Now, what's interesting here is that when one looks at the coronation, the first, the first thing one sees, of course, is what appears to be a kind of farcical, theatrical, ritualistic, participation in an antiquated performance of, of, I don't know, royalty. And yet, this in and of itself is not a criticism of the very thing. Here one can actually point towards Lacan. You may know this from my previous lectures, and I'm going to butcher the French, I warn you. Lacan has this idea where he says, les, les non-dupes se errant, which means the non-duped are duped. And the example is here, someone who walks into a courtroom and points at the judge and says, who makes you a better man than me? Why do you get to cast judgment on me? After all, can't you see that we are all simply human beings? Does your robe make you somehow better or more powerful than me? This would be the naive stance, the non-duped, the person who sees through the symbolic pomp of ritual and power and simply points out the obvious material reality, supposedly objective, namely that we are all human beings, what makes a king a king is just that we believe in him, etc. What makes a judge a judge is just that I have to stand before him. And yet, from a Lacanian perspective, this entirely misses the point. What makes the judge powerful is precisely that there is no material justification to his power, that he represents an empty space of symbolic authority. This is also what Lacan has in mind when he refers to the idea that there is no big other. The insight that there is no big other does not entail that because there is an empty place in the position of symbolic power, that therefore there is no power. It's quite the opposite. It's that it's precisely because there is an empty space that is not being figurated by itself, that it has to be filled in, that its emptiness is precisely what lends it its symbolic authority. That the reason the judge has power over you is precisely because symbolic power is 
in a sense, empty, has no natural grounding in two human beings exchanging ideas with each other, etc. And the exact same thing is true for the king. Here one can look towards Marx's footnote in Capital, Chapter 1, where he writes about the kind of fetishistic alienation that occurs or fetishistic illusion that occurs when one engages with the king. The idea, the idea being that the king is simply another man, except that we treat him like a king. And so therefore, if we stop treating him like a king, he would no longer be king. Now, from a Lacanian perspective, this is Marx being a naive idiot, one of the duped, who says, if we just stop treating the king like king, then he will thereby no longer be king. When the precise content of his kingness is never the direct identification with the idea of the holy representative of God on earth, etc. But it's precisely this minimal detachment that we have towards symbolic authority in which its very emptiness is precisely what allows us to fill it in. No one goes to the coronation and says, I was in doubt about the legitimacy of the crown until I saw the diamonds and pearls, and now I am a true believer. What sustains the participation is precisely that it allows this subjective distancing, that you don't have to assume belief because the king assumes belief on your behalf. Hence also why Lacan famously says that the ultimate fool is the king who believes himself to be king, that the king doesn't directly identify as being the sacred figure. The king, in his pomp, in his ceremonious garb, is, of course, a clown king, a, a, a ridiculously farcical, satirically over-dramatized, not just relic of an old existence, but a kind of walking corpse, a living dead. And trust me, the king knows this better than anybody else, that to be king, to have everybody be subject to you, precisely means that you are no longer a true subject to yourself. That the position of symbolic authority to be king, similar to being pope, or perhaps, and we'll get there, to being Christ, is to be a kind of foolish king, a mad king, a fool king, who everyone can see through, who no one fully believes in. That as soon as you step into the shoes of the symbolic authority, you die as a person, and you become this kind of clown. The theatrical, what, what Zizek calls the Hegelian performative of power. Now, what's interesting here, we'll, we'll take a moment. Oh, this is actually empty. This is very tragic. <laughs> empty cup. I need a refill. Okay. Um, okay, so let's take this idea here. The monarch as the clown king. What's key here is that this aspect of clownness doesn't make him less of a king, it makes him more of a king. The whole point is that the king doesn't have to convince you that he is necessarily the most suitable person to be king. It's precisely not a fair democratic election in which one chooses someone to represent the public. Instead, what the king does is almost the exact inverse, is that strictly speaking, the British king represents God on behalf of the British people. It's a fundamental inversion that takes place, and hence why one has to always keep in mind that the function of the British monarch, apart from the imperialistic figurehead, etc., is precisely the one who is supposed to fill in the gap between the godhead and the public. Of course, in today's secular, predominantly secular society, this role appears moot, it falls away, it doesn't seem very important. And so the question is, why does the king continue to exist if he no longer fills in this space, the space of the absent God? What is a king after the death of God? And in a sense, a king is a walking dead, a zombie-like figure who exists as a kind of specter that haunts its own ground. There's, there's something that uh, Finian, uh, Finian O'Toole, the Irish writer, has pointed out beautifully that the entire, the entire tradition of the monarchy in the UK today has something distinctly hauntological, to put it in Derry Dine terms, that it is a kind of, uh, a, kind of uh, a, a, a corpse, a relic, 
of its own exhumed historical necessity. Now, from here, we can actually make the leap towards an argument that Zizek makes about Christianity, which will help us understand why Zizek talks about the monstrosity of Christ, which is not unlike the monstrosity of the king. Now, Zizek has an argument that's quite interesting. He says it's tempting. He risks this argument. Of course, he understands the limits of this argument, so it's rhetorically tempting to see within the transition from Judaism to Christianity or Catholicism, from Judaism, from Judaism to Catholicism to Protestantism, a kind of dialectical Hegelian triad. Within Judaism, we have a faith in which God is one. God is absolute. God is universal. Of course, there are elements of pagan worship that persist as a kind of underlying real within Judaism. Zizek points out, to, points towards the passage in which God says that one has to worship him as one God when one faces God, but not when one turns his back to him, etc. There's always the lingering shadow of polytheism that exists within the monotheism of Judaism. <clears throat> of course, it is precisely within Judaism that we have what is usually the pejorative that we think about with the Catholic Church. Remember, the Catholics are often represented as being uh, uh, highly ritualistic, dogmatic, etc., too focused on ceremony, etc. But strictly speaking, this ceremony is necessitated. The ritualistic aspect of Judaism is much more developed and much more stronger, much more strong, because, because it relies on the participation of the believing subjects. Within Catholicism, one can have a minimal distance towards the ritual because one can watch its theatrical performance staged on one's own behalf. In the same way in which the king, the figure of the monarch, represents not God to the people, but also the people to God, in other words, that he, staged, that he steps into this gap. The church, the Catholic church's institution, intervenes and mediates between the people and the idea of God thereby allowing one a sort of minimal reflective distance towards the proceedings of the church, which is very convenient. Here we have a transition for Zizek from the idea of a sort of universalized God as one within Judaism towards a particular, namely the idea that we have the distinct separation of man and God, which has to be mediated between by the institution of the Catholic Church, its priests, its rituals, etc. And then the transition towards a singular universal, which is precisely that of Protestantism. Now, what is the defining feature of Protestantism? It is not only the emphasis on the text, but precisely that everyone ought to have access to the text, the Word of God, the Bible, etc. In other words, it universalizes the one God by emptying it out and placing it back into the hands of the individual particular reader. Hence why Zizek calls it the singular universal. The universal is staged on behalf of the particular. Therefore, one can, strictly speaking, get rid of all the ceremonial pomp and ritual which intervenes and mediates between the absolute and the particular person of the faithful, the believer, because now the text has been placed directly in the hands of the believer as such. Here we have, therefore, a transition, according to Zizek, between the idea of Judaism, Catholicism, and Protestantism, where Judaism upholds the idea of a singular unity of God, an absolute which is inscrutable, that remains forever out of our reach, that therefore has to be, in some sense, appeased by means of community, by means of participation in ritual. Then we have the gap within Catholicism, which is the proper gap between this inscrutable God of the above and the community of the faithful, which has to be mediated between by the institution of the church. And within Protestantism, we have the unfolding of this dialectical mediation into a singular universal by which the text itself outshines the idea of the Godhead and therefore allows direct access of the individual to the text. We can also see here how the Catholic Church, for example, would recite, and still does in many cases, the text in Latin, a language that most people do not know, 
whereas the idea of Protestantism is the direct engagement with the text as such. However, before we simply make the vulgar assumption that we have here a linear progression of advancement where Judaism is a kind of naive ritualistic faith, not, not, not what I'm saying, towards Catholicism, which is therefore the institutionalized necessity of the problem that presents itself first within Judaism and how to let go of the lingering polytheism that nevertheless persists within it, towards the higher resolution of Protestantism as the direct engagement with the text, etc. Before we succumb to this vulgar reading, what Zizek has in mind here is that, strictly speaking, the gap here persists but it is simply transposed in a different way. Namely, the gap between God and man is dealt with differently. Let's focus on Catholicism to make this more clear. <clears throat> Zizek argues that what makes Christianity and Catholicism in particular so interesting is that, strictly speaking, it announces a figure who is completely ordinary, namely Jesus, and nevertheless hinges the entire stakes of reality upon this figure. In other words, from the perspective of the Bajun event, after the crucifixion, nothing is ever the same. The event has already happened. It's why Zizek argues that Judaism is pre-evental in preparation for the coming of Christ. Whereas what Christians have to face is the problem that Christ has already arrived, that he has already come. It's like preparing for a dinner party versus having had the dinner party and clearing up the dishes. Now, Zizek makes the argument here, which he takes from Hegel, which is an ontological argument, which is that what dies on the cross isn't simply the particular figure, the historical figure of Christ. What dies on the cross is the God of the beyond itself. In other words, what happens within the New Testament is a revolution takes place, quite literally, by which the order of being, the ontological hierarchy that had hitherto existed between the transcendental dimension and the lower dimension of man becomes completely inverted. It is not that Christ dies on the cross, it is that God dies to himself on the cross. Hence, how for Zizek, God, to take a Hegelian term, posits his own presuppositions that Christ is the absolute subject. Christ is the singular universal, this kind of paradoxical necessity of a man who is God and a God who is man. Hence why Adam and Christ are two sides of the same coin, that in the same way that Adam falls from paradise in order that he might love the world, Christ is the one who falls from God so that God might love himself. Zizek says that, strictly speaking, it is as if God had ripped out his own eye to look at himself in the crucifixion that we have a God who becomes, in Lacanian terms, extimate, who divides himself in order to become himself. Here, of course, we have the Hegelian speculative unfolding of reason or spirit, which is precisely the, if you will, the teleology of ontology. Remember, one of Hegel's key insights is to, teleolo to take teleology and turn it into ontology. Ontology is the nature of being, the question into the nature of what is. Teleology is the question in the nature of purpose of what is. In other words, what something is, ontology, and what is it for, teleology? Where is it heading? And Hegel does the radical thing, which is to essentially turn ontology into teleology, to say that in order for God's essence to emerge, first it had to fall or succumb into its own internal limit. In other words, that which it is not, that God externalizes himself on the cross in order to become fully God. The problem of Christianity, which is its own solution, is therefore that the only way to be truly one is to be three. That the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, is therefore the highest resolution, the sublation in Hegelian terms, of the one. Hence, 
The movement that we see from Judaism towards upholding the idea of the pure divine one is completely split when it comes to Christianity into one as three, three as one. Here we can actually see an interesting difference between orthodoxy and Christianity. Within orthodoxy, we have again the upholding of the idea of God as one, which cannot fully reconcile the idea that it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Within orthodoxy, like uh, 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 Greek Slavic orthodoxy, the idea is that the Father is the top figure, the figurehead, and that Christ is the Son of the Father, and that the Holy Spirit emanates therefrom, but both emanate from within the Father. Father remains a priori, the necessary foundational figure. It's precisely within Catholicism that the seemingly linear trajectory becomes completely subverted, by which Father only emerges properly, precisely by the fall into Christ, and emerges retroactively as his own necessity in Holy Spirit. In other words, Holy Spirit, from a Hegelian perspective, is not simply a deviation from God. It is God appearing to himself through the community of the faithful. It is the necessary unspooling of the idea of the unitary Godhead that therefore emerges in the Holy Spirit. Now, this raises the question of Christ. What is the function of Christ in all this? Of course, one of the beautiful mistakes, one of the fallacies of contemporary evangelicism is precisely to neuter the most revolutionary part of Christ, which is to say, let's treat Christ not as the singular universal. Let's treat him not as God seeing himself. Let us not treat Christ as the absolute subject. Instead, let's simply re-internalize Christ into the lineage of philosophical masters and teachers. In other words, what are the wisdoms of Christ and how can one act as Christ did? Cookbooks that tell you how to eat the food that Christ might have eaten. Here we find the inverse side of the secular atheist coin which treats Christ simply as a historical figure by saying, let us treat Christ as a master, as a wise teacher who teaches us how to live. However, as soon as you teach, as soon as you treat Christ as this figure, that we have to follow in the footsteps of, one makes precisely, one, one, one leads irreveric, irre, I'm sorry, I'm, one, this leads us always to the problem, the righteous problem of Judaism. Namely, the Judaic outrage, how can one treat an ordinary individual like Christ, vulgar, common, contingent man, no different from anybody else, how can one elevate this person into the Son of God? Isn't that madness? One ends up there in the same problem with evangelicism, which is that if one neuters the figure of Christ away from the necessity of his own singular universality as God seeing himself in man, one therefore ends up with precisely this horrific figure of the contingent neutral man, the historical existence of Christ, where one has to do as Christ does, etc. Once Christ becomes a simple moralist, teaching one how to be a good person, no matter how exceptionally good of a person Christ might have been, we lose the fundamental dimension, the speculative core of the Christian moment, the event, the revolution, the crucifixion. However, what's interesting here is that, strictly speaking, this is true for all great revolutions in human thought. Think about Plato, for example. Plato, while clearly not Christ, although constitutive to the early church, one should say. Plato was not the kind of teacher who said, live like I live, do as I do, here are my maxims and morals. Of course, today we try to interpret Plato in those ways, trying to impose upon Plato a belief system which he didn't have, which was an instructive manual of how to live. And isn't this true for every great thinker even today, that one reduces their ideas which are usually re-articulations of existing problems in new ways, one reduces them into 
common sense aphorisms about how one ought to live one's life in order to be happy and productive, etc. In other words, to take the figure of Christ and to turn him into yet another self-help figure reduces Christ precisely to the Judaic pejorative apropos Christ, which is that he is simply another con man, another would-be messiah, as it were. Now we can start understanding why Hegel refers to Christ as das Ungeheure, a monstrous figure. Hegel says the idea, the sheer audacity of the fact that God would appear in such a frail human form as Christ must strike us as completely monstrous, as completely incompetent, as somehow the lowest form of what we believe to be the highest. I guess Zizek actually has the German here, which is quite beautiful. I don't know if I can find it. Uh, uh, oh, yes, I remembered. Simply by opening the book, I remembered. Hegel characterizes Christ as die Unangemessenheit überhaupt. Unangemessen is that something doesn't live up to something. It falls short. And überhaupt means altogether. That therefore Christ's appearance in physical form as God, son of God, is die Unangemessenheit überhaupt. It completely falls short. Here one also has to understand the Roman Judaic genteel response to Christ, which was, of course, precisely to say, you are the son of God? What makes you so special? Prove to us that you have some divinity to you, because nothing could be less divine than your mutilated corpse on a cross. And, of course, the Christian response to this is that the revolution that takes place between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is the properly, if you will, the decapitation of the idea of Godhead into the idea of the Holy Spirit, is precisely not the representation of divinity in its form, but the problematization of the very gap between form and divine content as such, that Christ on the cross, rather than being the representation of the divine content, is the marker and the symbol of the very failure, the immutable impossibility of signifying this gap, not just to man, but for God to represent it to himself. And that therein, within the fall of Christ, occurs the rise of God in man. Therefore, the inversion of what takes place with Adam, which is that within the fall of Adam, we have the rise of man human subjectivity. This leads Zizek to paraphrase Chesterton to say that one of the monstrous cores of Christian religiosity is precisely that it took a god who had to extricate man from himself, push man away, in order for man to truly know love. That in the same way that Lacan defines love in psychoanalytic terms as loving something in someone which is more than that person is. In other words, to love someone's lack. That love between man and God is not to love the purity and the absoluteness of God, but precisely to, la to love that which is lacking within God. And what is lacking within God, it is precisely man which has been cast off. Therefore, when Christ says, you will find me, i.e. God, when there is love between you, is not simply an aphoristic truism about the necessity of love and affection, but a distinctly logical proposition about the emergence of God precisely through the dialectical necessity of the contingency of love taking place between two individuals. In other words, we're back at what we started with last week, which is the necessity of contingency. The necessity of contingency is not that we simply have a divine will which posits the unfolding of occurrences, an a priori rational reason. Here you can also understand how within Catholicism, for example, like Pope Benedict would refer to the idea that Christianity is supposedly the highest form of rationality because he believes in the idea of reason, not in the empirical scientific sense, but the idea of reason almost in a German idealist sense. The idea of reason is the absolute, is the unfolding of spirits. But of course, what this 
characterization of Christianity falls short of what the Christian revolution entails. Christianity precisely after the, test, the New Testament does not entail absolute reason that functions by necessity. It is not the logic of intelligent design. Instead, it's precisely that Catholicism steps into the gap following the New Testament, the gap that has been properly ruptured between the idea of the transcendental absolute and the supposedly fallen man, through which and through whom God recognized himself in man. However, here we should be very careful not to succumb to the Feuerbachian New Hegelian stance. The Feuerbachian New Hegelian stance is to simply imply that uh, God is therefore a kind of collective manifestation or representation of human uh, collectivity. In other words, this is very close to some contemporary atheists who argue that we need something like God. And that therefore, when we come together to console each other, it is convenient to have a God to worship. Of course, the inverse, the Feuerbachian inverse, is much more dark, which is that it is not that we need God, but that it is God who needs us in order to worship him. However, this fundamentally misses the crucial Hegelian point, which is it is not a direct exchange between who needs whom. It is not that we need God, as some atheists might say, or that God needs us, as Feuerbach would say. It is precisely that it is only through the fall of God into the singular, contingent, vulgar, material reality of ordinary man, namely Christ, that God appears to himself through us. In other words, the dialectical mediation is not the transition from some divine holy other into us, nor is it from our collective consciousness that it is imposed upon the symbolic other of God. Instead, it is precisely in the immutable gap between these two perspectives, between as what Hegel called substance and subject, that religiosity emerges. Hence why, for Hegel, Christ is a monstrous figure. After all, Christ is simply a man, some guy, who happens to be the contingent vessel for Hegel, of the unfolding of a dialectical inversion that transfers and transforms the very nature of reality itself. In other words, the very hierarchy of transcendental absolutes becomes fallen, made subject, and therefore man becomes substance. Therefore, the Hegelian formula is not simply subject equals substance, but the properly chiasmic formula, substance equals subject equals substance, that in this X, the X which is represented in the cross, we have therefore the interminable moment in which substance realizes itself in subject and subject realizes itself in substance. And the vanishing mediator of this movement is the suffering Christ. And therefore, for Hegel, Christ is monstrous because Christ is wholly inadequate, no pun intended, as the material necessity that has to fade away in order for this dialectic to unfold. And so what makes Christ monstrous, which is it calls the monstrosity of Christ, is precisely that Christ is not to be worshipped as God or as man, but that Christ is the almost utilitarian transference of God into his own other in order to see himself. In other words, Zizek characterizes Christ as the anamorphosis of God. That God can only see himself by looking at himself in the distinctly wrong way. And that the figure of Christ, therefore, is not the representation of divinity. It is not simply the figural form of the divine content, but instead the representation of that ineffable excess, the indivisible remainder within God himself that can only exist through its own fall 
into existence. Therefore, we have, when I say the dialectical unfolding, I mean the coming together, the emergence of a teleology, which is ontology, of substance into subject. And therefore, Christ, in a sense, is deserving of our mercy, of our pity even. Christ as the historically contingent reality of some man on whom rests the responsibility of reality as such. And therefore, the ultimate mistake to make apropos Christ is to simply see Christ in a kind of legalese that we have debt and that Christ is the one who releases us from our debt. Of course, this is where one can see how this would easily become an anti-Semitic appropriation of the idea of Christ, that it is simply an exchange, a monetary exchange, that we have sin and that Christ releases us of our sin as if sin were simply student loans. The problem of Christ is precisely that he is not the representative of God on earth. He has not come here to tell us what to do or who God is. In a sense, Christ, as a representative of God, is a failure. He is the fool king, and he is made to suffer and to look like a fool by those who fail to see the revolution that is staged within this unwillingness to perform as representative of God. When he is mocked for being a false prophet who cannot properly prove that he is God because he cannot even save himself, the incentive structure and the logic of this imperative, save yourself, prove that you are God, remains fixed within the theological order of God as the inscrutable, higher, powerful, mystical absolute. It is precisely in God's failure to intervene on Christ's behalf that God realizes himself. Hence why Christ is not simply the son of the father, as orthodoxy would have it, but the father himself. Hence why Christ is not just the father, but also Adam, also man himself. That within the vanishing mediator of the suffering and tormented body of Christ, namely the mutilated corpse of Christ, we have the monstrosity of Christ, the man who is both God and man, who cannot, therefore, continue to exist, who has to fade away, who is, once again, the vanishing mediator between the deity and man, that the reconciliation of man with God is, therefore, the reconciliation of God with himself. And the person who is almost one dare say it conveniently discarded, is therefore Christ. And therefore Christ's sacrifice is precisely the ultimate sacrifice of foregoing his material historical contingency and adopting the symbolic position of the unfolding of what is the most radical revolutionary change in the idea of religiosity. It is no longer the task of man to be reunited with God in the above, because God has made it his task to be reunited with man through Christ. And that is what Zizek calls the monstrosity of Christ, or what Hegel calls das Ungeheure, the un, un uh, the un, what is it, the, the unangemessenheit selbst. That it is precisely the frailty of Christ, the shortcoming of Christ, the imperfection of Christ, the suffering of Christ, the torment of Christ, the mutilated corpse of Christ, that is therefore elevated into the symbolic marker of the necessity of God's fall into himself, which is the rise of man into the, fall of, into the fallen God, which is himself. In other words, the unification into the Holy Spirit. And hence why Christianity is the monotheism of three that recognizes that the only way to be fully one is to be dissected into three. And the dissection of God into three requires the dissection of Christ on the cross. And that is what Zizek calls, building upon Hegel, the monstrosity of Christ.
Thank you guys so much. I hope that you've enjoyed this lecture. I'm going to be continuing this discussion on Discord for another hour afterwards. Uh, these classes are entirely open access and free. If you'd like to read more about this, you can find Zizek's book, The Monstrosity of Christ, a dialogue with John Milbank. Uh, I want to very briefly say thank you for watching. Uh, if you'd like to support these classes, I would very much appreciate it if you considered becoming a patron on YouTube or on Instagram if you considered donating $1. There's a subscription on Instagram that you can join, a members-only group. It costs $1, and it doesn't seem like a lot, but collectively it makes a huge difference in terms of helping me sustain these classes for free and keeping them open access for everybody. I believe that education should be free. I think that learning is empowering. I think it is something that anyone should be able to do. I don't think that you should have to go to university in order to study these thinkers. And so if you'd like to support me in this, please do consider making a $1 donation on Instagram or becoming a patron on YouTube. The Patreon is www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. And if you haven't already, as a patron, you can also download my ebook, Five Lessons on Zizek which is available exclusively for patrons, and I very much hope that you will read it because uh, I, I, I just think it's a good book. I've worked hard on it. I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you guys so much, and I will see you in the Discord. Thanks, guys.